Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 471, featuring an interview with the fabulous Mr. Rick Francis, the creator of that mod uh, for Eye of the Beholder. Actually, he did the, both games, or the first two games of that series, uh, for the Neverwinter Nights Aurora engine, and it is built in now into Beam Dog's Enhanced Edition of Neverwinter Nights available on Steam. Uh, anyway, Rick watched the review I did in the uh, previous episode and wanted to come on and talk about it, and I was like, hell yeah, come on, Rick. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I think it's a really uh, fun interview, good chat, and I think you will uh, enjoy it. So uh, stay tuned. Then, and then after the chat, I will be reviewing a Belgian ale, my first uh, effort to create my own Belgian ale. So we'll see how that goes. That's finally ready <laughs> after about, about four months. Uh, I think, to make that. So that, that's pretty exciting. Uh, anyway, got a lot to cover here. So without further ado, here is Mr. Rick Francis. All right, folks, I am here today with Rick Francis, and he is the modder, the the genius, the hard, the hardest working modder <laughs> in the industry. Uh, oh. And he has made a really incredible... Uh, module or I guess a, a patch, what, whatever you want to call it. It's a conversion of this game, Eye of the Beholder, with the engine, uh, the ship would never win her nights. And it's, it's really, really awesome. I've been playing the, uh, the heck out of it with a good friend of mine doing the co-op, you know, mode and having a lot of fun. I covered it in my uh, last video. And in that video, I said, man, it'd be great to talk to Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I guess Ricky must have seen the video and then said, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I actually got an email from Bernard at beam dog, uh, the morning after you had posted it and he's like, Hey, did you see this? And I was like, no, I had no idea. Matt was doing a, a review. So I clicked on the, the link and I, I just watched the entire review of you playing it. And, um, it's kind of funny because when you see your own work being played by somebody else, mm -hmm. it gives you a different perspective. And I was just sitting there kind of cringing a little bit too, because I was like, oh man, is he going to like it? <laughs> so I was like, I don't know. You know, it's like you, you put all this hard work and your heart and soul into something like that. And you really want it to be successful and you want people to like it, you know, and, you know, and sometimes you get some people that get a little critical about stuff, you know, and so oh, you sure. just kind of take it with a grain of salt and you just like, you listen to what they have to say and you're like, okay, we'll try to fix that or we'll try to make it better, you know, just to, to try and meet everybody's standards out there. And it, and it's a, it's a really hard thing to do. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. Yeah. I was just thinking this, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know if somebody casually just picking this up and, and playing it, they, they probably have no conception, no idea uh, about how much, I mean, you talk about a labor of love. I mean, this, oh, this yeah. I mean, this, by, I mean, give, can you give us like an idea of just the time and <laughs> okay, effort this so took? I started on this mod. Uh, okay. So what happened is originally we, I, cause I love Eye of the Beholder, man. I was in Japan at the time when I was in the Marine Corps and I found out about this game. I got a copy of it and I'm, and the next thing I know, I'm sitting there until three in the morning playing it. So, and yeah. so anyway, I fell in deeply in love with the entire series at that time. So then years later, Neverwinter Nights, and also this is when Dungeon Siege was also coming mm -hmm. out. And I knew about Dungeon Siege first, and I started looking at the tool set that they had there because um, I was like, when I played through the game with a couple of my friends, they had like this one creature that looked like a beholder. And I was like, oh, wow. I could use that for like making a, a reproduction of like Eye of the Beholder. So I started looking at his tool set and I don't know if you've ever looked at it or whoever else may have. It's not a very easy tool set to use. Uh, everything is kind of like in a puzzle formation, like geometry, and you have to actually put it together in certain sections and stuff like that and rotate it. And I was like, oh man, this is really going to take forever, mm -hmm. right? So then right after that, I got an invite to, I don't know if it was an open beta at the time, but I got an invite to the beta to the Neverwinter Nights, right? They let us play the first act, I believe it was. But they also released a tool set with that at the time. So I started playing around with the tool set and I was like, oh, this is D&D. &D. And then I was like, oh, it's in modular sections and stuff. It looks more like Out of the Beholder. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, this is going to work, right? So I just started digging into that and started playing it. Well, uh, before I knew it, I was getting in over my head. 
because I had no idea of the complexity that it was going to take to actually do the scripting and the sheer amount of things that you needed to do with that uh, tool set. Now, did you start off wanting to do the eye of the beholder? Con I did. That was the I, first project. It was. <laughs> That's yes. a very ambitious. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I just love that. You know, just sure. like you, I, I love it, you know, and I, I wanted to try and convert it to play a more modern thing like that. Right. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I started digging into the tool set and I was like, okay, here's a door and then this door is supposed to be locked. And then I need to put a lever down. Right. So I put down the lever and I go in there and I'm like trying to activate it. I'm like, it's not working. What do I do here? So then you right click on it. You right look at the properties of the, the, the actual lever and you say, Oh, okay. So this is going to require some scripting. And then you start digging and you start trying to figure out how to script. Right. So then I was like, man, this is getting a little more in depth than I was expecting. So anyway, I started digging around uh, uh, BioWare's scripts and seeing how they were doing things. And, and I, then that's how I figured out uh, a lot of things to do. But then it started to get even worse because a lot of the puzzles which you've played, you saw how it wor things work for some of the puzzles. You know, like It's like you come to this one room and there's a bunch of pressure plates on the ground, right? all over the place but you have to go in there and lay down uh, put stuff down on top of a pressure plate on this one and on this one on this one and this one the classic pressure the door. Plate puzzle. yeah in order to get the door to open right so i was like oh my god i don't know how to do that right so i started talking to the community and trying and getting some of the community members involved and that's whenever i ran into a friend of mine who's really a good friend of mine now his name is mika uzanowski and actually What's really cool about Mika is that he started off, I met him when he was just getting out of school and he was trying to get into game development and scripting and stuff like that. So I turned him on to a friend of mine who was Chris Taylor um, at Gas Power. Yeah, games. this is the Chris Taylor. Yeah. yeah. We, we kind of so, knocked his dungeon. Know, we kind of knocked his dungeon siege engine a while ago. Yeah, because I know <laughs> I know Chris. I met him years ago or when at E3 and I just ended up becoming a very good friend with him over the years. And he's just a, a really great guy. Mm -hmm. So I, I pointed him in his direction and Chris wasn't able to actually use his skill sets, but he ended up working for um, Mitch Gittleman and they worked on, I think I forgot the name of the game. It was called shadow something. I don't know if you recall it or not. Yeah, the shadow, uh, is, that a, is that a TSR game? Shadow. It, yeah. I can't remember the exact name of it, but no, it was, it was, Anyway, they created this game, right? So he ended up working for him for like a year or two there. And then after that, Mika caught on with Bioware. And that's who he works for now. Oh, cool. Yeah. So Mika has his hands very deeply in uh, both Eye of the Beholder mods. And he helped do a lot of the, the, a lot of the complexity and the real complex scripting that's going on in this game. In fact, uh, Sunday, we worked all day on the final Dran fight because we originally the way we had dran is like you go into the room the cutscene kicks off dran threatens you that you finally found him but now he's going to destroy you and so then once he the cutscene ends he stands there he goes invisible he blasts you with some uh, magic missiles and then he teleports to another location and then eight seconds later he blasts you again with some more uh, magic missiles and then Bastard. from there on yeah from so so from there on the fight goes toe to toe just fighting right so it becomes just kind of like a stagnant fight so mika was like yeah i like the whole idea of him teleporting around so he went in there and he wrote the entire final cutscene fight and the way it is so now what happens is that you go in there he goes invisible he leaves behind a fire elemental to distract the party he blasts you with the the um magic missiles and then he randomly will teleport to teleport around the room to different locations it's never the same way you know always it's a random thing that he wow. built into there so the entire fight is of you fighting him and him teleporting around and leaving fire elements all over the place that you got to deal with and then until you finally kill him and then he transforms him you know into his other final form so really you guys are doing stuff that even bioware never yeah never anticipated i mean this is not I built-in mean, stuff you have to like script all this. i mean since i started on this module i have several thousand hours in both mods but just since beam dog contacted me i have 225 hours into more work that we have done to the mod since then 
Let's, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So I guess you had, you did this work. You must have, you put it on like Neverwinter Revolt, I think. Neverwinter Nights. It, it was, right. That it was, was up a huge there. thing by IGN for a long time. But yeah. then just sort of out of the blue, you hear from Beamdog. Well, see, what happened is the original IGN was running the Neverwinter Vault. Mm -hmm. But then IGN decided to pull the plug on the whole thing. And boy, did that upset the community big time. I mean, so then what happened is that a bunch of the older Bioware guys who are now Beamdog and some other people, they started up a new Neverwinter Vault. And mm -hmm. I, the, the new vault that where you can get download all this stuff. And... Uh, Man, Beamdog, they're just such a great bunch of guys, you know, for the things that they've been doing over the years with this, this engine and stuff now. You can't say enough about what they've been doing. But, um, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, you can get everything from there now. And then when Beamdog finally reached out to me and contacted me, they're like, yeah, we would like to put your module in our new curated program that they're doing. And, um so they're reaching out to certain modders out there that have high quality mods and they're bringing all their stuff in. And mine was like, I don't know, mine was like the third module that, all, along with uh, Rich Baker's that you mentioned earlier that oh, yeah, the, for uh, the other guy for the, uh, uh, the uh, serpent, uh, serpent module. Uh, against the cult of the reptile. Uh, yeah, the reptile, there you go. Yeah, so they, they, they brought both of our modules in at the same time. And... Um, and then you ended up catching a hold of mine because you because you're such a big fan of Oz Over and he's like, how this miss my radar? And, yeah, you know, I was. I don't know what you know. I saw that patch up there. I'm like, oh, well, okay, that's kind of interesting. Still, I mean, it's kind of impressive. There's Beam Dog is still like updating this and all, all that. But then to scroll down a little bit, created content. What? Yeah. All I got to do is, you know, what I liked about this, I didn't have to like go to a bunch of websites and mess around with folders or anything. It just couple yeah, of buttons it, and you're playing eye of the beholder I, I, I was so happy when they reached out to me to do this because i was actually in the process of looking at doing it through the steam workshop hmm. and that so i could make it easier for people to get a hold of the mod that way because you know you can go to neverwinter vault and you can get both modules there and i also have an imdb page that has neverwinter nights or uh legend of dark moon there that you could download it but just having it out there on um inside built into the game like this is just it's a it's a blessing really and I like i said have you heard from a lot of people that have played it and i is, have is it is it like eye of the beholder fans is it people uh, that, it's I mean, what kind of community i mean what, <laughs> do they have anything in common yeah it's everybody in general actually a lot of the original eye of the beholder fans have played it and they love it in fact i have this one guy uh tim who will email me every so often. He's, he works in, in the Midwest somewhere out there. I'm not sure exactly where, but he's a farmer. So he has, he's, uh, does a lot of work, you know, and he can't do gaming during the summer year months or the spring and stuff like that, you know, or the fall because they're constantly busy, but every winter him and his wife, and they get a couple of friends and they play both modules. Oh, that's through. cool. And they just love the mod, man. He just talks so much praise about it. In fact, he posted a, a comment on your uh, the YouTube page wherever you when you did the the review hmm. on there. So yeah, it's. But I hear from a lot of people like that, you know, that talk about the module. People will also report back to me about, hey, we kind of find a little thing here happening. Do you know what's causing that or this or that? So then we end up having to dig into it and see what's going on, you know, because like whenever I, I was watching you play and you pointed out a couple of little graph uh, grammar errors, right? <laughs> And I was just like, oh, man, oh, really? these, these pesky English <laughs> professors, man. Yeah. So uh, but anyway, we went back and we fixed all that now. Right. So it must not be new, too hard the, to fix. No, okay. it's not. But the thing is, is what you don't realize is like there's thousands of lines of dialogue that we have. in. Oh, I'm in the sure. Mark, yeah. And it's tough to find it all because I'm not an English guy. My friend Dan, who loves D&D, &D, he's read all the books. He did a lot of the writing for you know a lot of the character backgrounds and stuff like that and and the expanded stories that we put into the mods and um it, it's we had people actually beta testing just to find dialogue errors and grammar problems and stuff like that but always some little thing always crops up <laughs> you know they'll find one out there you know i so, can handle that that's the sort of bug i think anybody can really handle yeah but i mean if you were saying some we were talking a little bit before this about some uh uh some water 
uh, some shiny water and some, oh yeah um some so headaches that was given you guys what, I mean, yeah the, um what happened the, with the water was um i guess the ati drivers had a problem with shiny water and it was especially in <laughs> never winter nights but luckily uh bioware had a an option in there where you can turn shiny water off and it fixed that so that's how that they got around that yeah that must be some of the some of the challenges but yeah let's just take a look at the engine you got it ready to go up there right sure yeah let's look at this and share oh, the screen what what is it that you'd like to look at the wonderful world of zoom well, i don't know take us on a little tour of your uh right. your workshop if you so, for lack of a better word this this is the original eye of the beholder right here and as you can see some of the levels are split like i was telling you earlier well, the, the reason that we had to split levels is because it, it was causing some major performance issues with uh, certain, you know, on PCs, you know, especially low end PCs. So like I can open up, um, what's, what's a good level to open? I'll just open the original level. Game. It says yeah. it requires an IBM PC, requires hard drive and two floppy drives. <laughs> uh, 640K, wow. <laughs> yeah so what is never winter nights require back in the day it's supposed to run on a pentium pentium yeah 3? yeah so you can see here oh that um, looks cool yeah well I, let me turn off that grid just no i don't remember if it was chris i remember several of the guys i've interviewed who you know do some of the hiring of some of these studios you know i always ask them about you know what if you're a kid or somebody that wants to get into the gaming industry what's uh you know how do you how do you basically impress the person interviewing you and more than a few have mentioned this tool set mm -hmm. and they say you know if you can put together a good dungeon or a good level or, you know a whole game be <laughs> you know yeah. ideal but you know if you can show that you have some uh some some uh you know some abilities to basically put a level together that's a lot more impressive than just taking classes or yeah you know, this is like showing that you actually can do stuff with the knowledge. Let me turn off those sounds. Um, so my son doesn't, he doesn't have a, he has a gamer type uh, keyboard and it doesn't have a keypad. And unfortunately, the way they designed the tool set is the keypad, you have to use the keypad numpads to actually scroll. And I'm not sure how you scroll without it. Numpad, wow, that's, yeah. You call that a keyboard? <laughs> Yeah. So this particular room, and there's a several rooms in here, you can see these little flags, right? So basically, yeah. these little flags are spawn points and stuff. So oh. and then there's a trigger. I don't see so you can see the blue outline of the trigger right here. Well, this trigger is when you walk into the room, it sets off the script. And basically, it's a mummy spawner. And uh, what happens is that you can see how the script gets a little complex. So there's effects that go off. And basically what happens is that there's these little um, rune stones in here, right? As long as those rune stones are alive, they're going to keep spawning mummies. So what you have to C go- C or C sharp? What are we looking at there? I think it's some type of C that they use. Oh, well, they got their own. Yeah. So- Recognize that void main loop. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you had to put all this in. Yeah. So basically what will happen is like I was saying, let me close this. There's these little, these little rune stones right here that you can see there's four of them throughout the room. And you have to, you, when you want enter into the room, you're like, oh, I'm being bombarded by uh, these mummies, right? So you have to go and you, once you destroy these, and I think we have a trigger somewhere that tells you something about it. Cause we have like henchmen pop-ups, like this is a flavor script, but this is what they call it for some reason. I can't tell you why, but when you go to the module itself, there's a lot of, uh, when you hit one of those triggers, it will give you a bunch of this pop-up text uh, for whatever one we've got it set. And there's a lot of these throughout it. And basically these are giving you hints or kind of warning you about something's about to occur throughout the game. So like whenever you first entered into the, whenever the cave-in happened and it, you got this little pop-up came up, it says, looks like uh, 
there's forces working against us here. No turning back now. I don't mm-hmm. know if you remember seeing that pop up, but that's that's a that's one of the triggers that you hit. And then you know, then you get another one like the stench of color balls all over the place here too. Little triggers, and it just oh, gives cool you balls. some. Yeah, it just gives Those you guys some. Guys are uh, smelly. <laughs> so you know, we just we try to give little pop up hints about things because there's a lot of things that you can overlook. It's like when you first played through, um, went into the area before you went down into the sewers, you never noticed that you could go behind the waterfall into the secret area there, did you? You missed that completely, a secret level. I probably did miss that. Yeah. How can you not check behind a waterfall? Yeah, Yeah, so here, check out this hidden waterfall because this this area is highly detailed. We get a lot of compliments about the detailing in the mod. And you can see here, like when you first walk in, you can see the roots and stuff, of how they're above you. And that's basically what these are is the roots coming down. And then you can see the dirt and you, this is the waterfall where you first pop in right here. And then you go around because you talk to the, uh, the bugbear guy in the jail cell and he mentioned to you about this, but you never explored it. <laughs> there's just a lot of yeah, there's things a... that people don't realize that are in the Well, mod. that's why, you know, when I buy a game like this, I get the, the clue book. You know, they should really call these clueless books. <laughs> now, for those who are clueless, yeah, I must have just totally blinked. But I have to say, we, we found a bunch of stuff, <laughs> like walls yeah. you can just walk through and stuff. Right. Yeah. In fact, Mika made those walls because that was the other challenge, too, is like, oh, man, there's a bunch of invisible, uh, not invisible, but, you know, illusionary walls yeah, that illusion. you walk through. And we're like, oh, we don't have that. So Mika, what he did is he went into the mod like this. He found the, the actual files. He would pull out a section of the wall right here. And then he would take away the, the collisions off of it and then just made it into a placeable. And then we have ones that do have the collisions, so you can't get through them. But we'll have a trigger or a script later like that makes a wall disappear so you can get through that area. Yeah, it sounds so. like it's almost kind of a, a game in and of itself, just rigging up all this stuff. Yeah, you wouldn't believe uh, just how much goes into it. I mean, there's just a ton of things that you can do. And I remember there's a puzzle early on where you have to like throw a dart at oh, a yeah. through a gate. And I, for some yeah. reason, I felt like that was giving you guys some, some trouble. It, it, it Well, what happened is like you when you have henchmen with you, the henchmen can get a little stupid sometimes and they'll do stuff. Like they'll take off after uh, an enemy. And like when you have the pit trap like you had there, you saw Todd, he actually ran across that pit trap. And the next thing he knew, he was gone. He fell through the pit trap. Well, the problem that we had with those, uh, those wall buttons being as a flagged as an enemy, so you could attack them with a dart, is that the henchman would take off and try to attack it. So I went in there. And basically what I did is there's a, an object in the game that's a, uh, a, like a dartboard. So I put the dartboard over there as the button, and then we set a script on it. So whenever you throw at it, which we told you how you have to right click and just use, so you throw at it. And then what it'll do is it'll destroy the dartboard and basically what's supposed to be the button. And then it makes that pit close or a wall disappear or whatever. There's several it's, places it's, like it's that. It's clever. You know, it's, yeah. That's what I'm so saying. It's like all these little innovative things you have to do to make it work. Oh, yeah. I mean, work around years of work of things that you come up with and try to think and, you know, and it's uh, it, it gets to be daunting at times. What's the hardest thing you've done? Uh, OK, so you it wasn't so much in this one. It was more in I the Beholder 2 because I the Beholder 2 had a lot more complexity to it mm-hmm. with puzzles. So the pit traps i can open that i can show you the script for this pit trap so basically the pit traps they have certain pit traps in in two where the, they alternate the timing of them how they open and close throughout the, the level and uh i couldn't do that I couldn't write that script. There's just no way. I'm because uh, I'm not really a scripter. I'm I do more of this kind of stuff. So there is another guy who I met. His name was Jeff. He was the guy from Australia, and Jeff wrote these scripts for this. Uh, it's really it's really awesome. And all these uh, 
you know, this community that just say, yeah, yeah, I can jump in and do that for you. I mean, how awesome is that? Yeah. Let me find it. I think it's a heartbeat here. Let me find it. Shit. Unactivated. I really feel like I'm ones. seeing behind the curtain here. That's out. This is how the sausage gets made. <laughs> yes. Let me find where the script's at. This is the wind wall part, how you get through the wind wall with the four horns. You know, when I'm scripting something like this and get frustrated, I sometimes put naughty words in the comments. Oh, oh <laughs> you, you never do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. work, blank. I, actually, I think what it is, is it's on the actual level itself where the script's at on the That's heartbeat the, of the oh. level. So deadly challenge. Are these names, you know, these are all the names of the uh you know, I don't think there was actually names on the things. We came up with these names oh. and tried to make them like that. So okay, so here's a heartbeat script. Basically, every eight seconds, what'll happen is that it the script goes out and it fires itself. So this is the pit traps for the alternating opening and closing. Can you tell how that ones and zeros would work? I because I couldn't. That's how he wrote this. It's a, it's an amazing thing that he did. It's like one open, zero closed or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can sort of see it. Well, some of them are. So line 48, I guess, is the only one that's open at the beginning. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It makes and... me feel better that you don't know. Because. <laughs> uh, oh, I yeah, just... look, look, open. So yeah, yeah, the comments right above. He's, that, yeah. he's trying to tell us here how they're working. One stuff, is open, so but that's like hex or something, right? Right, right. The binary. But I don't know how he figured that out, but he did it. And I'll tell you this: he got the timing down perfectly. So you really got to be on your game when you go into that area, because we even warned the player, I think, beforehand when you get there to, hey, you might want to. Uh, you're, you're going to probably lose your henchman. He's going to fall through no matter what. So we tell you, don't worry about it. Basically, after you get through this area, just use one of those potions of recall, go to the thing. Because once you use that, the henchman will always come back to you. And I believe the henchman after, I don't know if it's like 10, 15 or 20 seconds or sometimes maybe even a little longer, but they will eventually find their way back to the party leader. So it's good. you get attached to those henchmen. Yeah, and you need them at times because you can really get, You'll get beat up if you're not careful. So that's one. And it's like, he did this other one too. Like, let me show you the, I think it's this one, like the lightning trap. Yeah, do you see all the little things? And then you see the scripts on them, right? But uh, basically each one of these represents the uh, a lightning. So what happened is that these little light patterns will they'll they'll disappear and then they'll reappear and it's a timing thing and you have to watch them so basically when it disappears walk forward when the next one disappears walk to that that block because if you get stuck on a platform you're going to get blasted with lightning like the original traps and this timing is right on identical to to the original games timing yeah it's so cool being able to see these puzzles from this point of view you know it's it's hard enough just <laughs> getting yeah. through them imagine trying to program this yeah it's i'm just trying to figure now, out when you were, when you were making this uh these mods did you have like the original game set up somewhere on another computer or, like side by side or i mean how did um, you luckily, I mean, how, how much did luckily, you worry about making it like really close uh we tried to make it represent it um as much as close as possible to the original i used the clue books as as a reference a lot and then also there's videos out there of people actually playing uh the original game so i would go and i would scour through their videos and watch the gameplay just to see if we're getting something correctly or if we're missing something so but a lot of the puzzles were all everything like i said all, all the original puzzles are in the game for the most part, almost every one of them are in both games. And there's those pits. Yeah. The dreaded pits. Yep. Yeah, this is the Legend of Dark Moon right here. So, and then I can, you know what, I'll show you this other one, the Dran cutscene stuff, how complex that was, the one that Mika just wrote. So 
basically you come over here, you enter. This is where you would enter into Dran's throne. And this script here is what you would see. It kicks off the cutscene, basically right here, all of this. Okay, so you have to time all of this out. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times we had to play this to get the timings down. And just, it's, it's a big deal. Does it let you instantly preview it or does it have to do with your lengthy sort of no uh, rendering we actually, thing or we actually have to um pilot process yeah we actually have to go in and play it all oh, the time wow. so here's this is the this is the one for dran when he starts to jump around this is the script right here so this is the new script he just ran uh he wrote all this i mean it, it's a it's a it's a cool script of him jumping around and it's like every 30 seconds he'll execute this script again and he'll fire start jumping around and then the fake drans will start firing uh magic missiles at you the really cool thing about this is is um i don't know if it's in this one where i find it here's where he spawns the fire elementals okay see here where starfire glows so at towards the beginning of the game when you go down into the catacombs you find uh your first uh henchman that you can hire and that's insul so Insul, when he joins your party, you don't know much about him, but the first time you rest, just like the original game, he bails on the party and he steals items from you. And he leaves you a note behind. And he says, I got to have Starfire for myself. I'm sorry, but I gotta, I'm leaving. And then he leaves you. Well, later on, up in uh, the later levels in the Crimson Tower, you find uh, Insul. He's been, he's been crucified by Dran because <laughs> you know, he, he's torturing him. And, but you find Starfire, the Starfire Scepter right here later. Well, what the player doesn't know is Starfire has some special abilities to it. So you can cast like uh, magic resistance on you and you have to do this yourself, right? But as long as you have Starfire on you, when you enter into the final fight with Dran, Starfire will protect you from his magic missile attacks. It'll automatically cast uh, magic uh, uh, resistance on you. It's really cool. And you'll see this little text pop up every time it does where Starfire glows. Starfire I mean, it's, it's, glows. Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, the, the yeah. way he wrote this script was just pretty amazing. And then the things that happen in this. And, and this is the things that people, when they're playing, they don't realize what they're seeing, what's going on in the back end, you know, what you go through to get this to work right. So, I mean, there's just a lot of stuff. Yeah, for them, it, it probably just looks easy. But yeah, I mean, imagine for y'all, this must have been just like magic when it all yeah. worked out and it was well it was so funny because when i was watching your review and he's like oh anybody could get in here and just start making a mod you know and you know that people could but you you start to realize after you're playing with it that there's you you can only do the the basic stuff you mm -hmm. if you want to do more complex stuff like this here then you're going to have to find somebody that knows what they're doing and how to do it because i'll tell you when we first when i first started working on the mod I didn't realize about uh, spawning triggers, like encounter triggers and stuff like that for spawning the enemies and stuff around the map. You know, you can spawn them. I just started going into the map and I just started throwing stuff down everywhere. I was like, oh yeah, this will work, cool. Then I start up the game and you start playing. I was like, whoa, it's lagging like crazy. What's going on here? Well, come to find out, it's like, you got too much stuff in the game, man. They, all these guys, all these things are, you know, taking up resources and memory. So I had to go back and I had to restructure everything. I, I can't tell you how many times um, this module's gone through uh, version reiterations, you know, to get it to where it's at right now and just how clean it is and kind of as bug free as possible that we can try and get it, you know. I mean, so a lot of people. It's a lot less in, buggy than Everwinter Nights 2, anyway. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I can't comment on that. So I don't know. But. Yeah, but I've, I've had a lot of people comment and saying, you know, yeah, I played all the way through it and I've had, met very minimal bugs. And, you know, we're happy to hear that because it means that we're doing it right when we do it then, you know. So and anytime somebody reports it, well, we try to fix it. So yeah, I don't think we've run into any bugs. Yeah, nothing that we couldn't couldn't solve just by reloading or something like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was funny, too, when I was watching you play. And you made a comment when you got down to the second level. He's like, oh, it'd be nice to have another henchman. 
But do you know, right before you go down to the second level, you totally missed the dog henchman that you could have hired? <laughs> you missed him. He was well, in the cage. I'm sure. You know, I probably should have read the, the clue book. <laughs> well, no, the dog isn't there. We added him. He's, he's special. Oh, this is a special dog. Yeah. The, he, he's in the fight with the final boss fight. Did you fight the Blagian? And then, um, so the dog is in the cage over there. He's being penned up. So basically... So I was like, well, Matt totally missed that. So what I did is I put down a little pop-up trigger now that says, oh, in the distance, you hear a dog barking in the cage. So it gives you a kind of a clue to, oh, what's yeah. going on over here? Yeah, that's the, yeah, I guess that must be one of the tricky things. It's just like, what's going to be obvious to the player and what, you know, where to, you don't want to just be like, <laughs> look at the dog. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but, you know, how do you draw, how do you draw that line? Right, because that's when I was watching you play. I was like, wow. I was like, yeah, I never thought about that. And I was like, he's doing things that I wouldn't have done. And I'm like, okay. So it makes me start to rethink how I need to either maybe start changing some things or try to do things differently. Well, I so, wouldn't change it up too much on my account. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, no, just the, just the part uh, where you missed the dog. So I was like, well, maybe I need to put something there that lets people know that the dog's over there, you know, because you can be missed easily. Especially because you play you played the game a lot of the times with it zoomed out further. So you would kind of miss. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. That's something I want to ask you about was just, <laughs> you know, as somebody who's obviously played both games, I mean, I mean, how much difference does it make to you? Like the, the, the difference in like being able to zoom out and, and get that different perspective. And no, I remember that really. Making, yeah. yeah how much does that change the experience about being able to play, you know, instead of an isometric view to go down lower. But if you get down that way, it's really hard for you to play me personally. I zoom out when I'm wanting to look around, yeah. but when I'm actually getting into combat, I'll zoom back in a little more than halfway so I can watch the combat and look around. Yeah. I don't know how I'd feel at this point to go back to the original game. I'd probably feel kind of constrained. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I don't think you could really do multiplayer with this one, could you? The original? Yeah, but I guess you could have your friends sitting around with you. Uh, you're talking about the actual original SSI game? Oh, yeah, Eye of the Beholder. Oh, yeah, I don't think that could do that. In fact, it's funny because um, one of the guys who helped me QA the mods, and he still is, he goes by the name of uh, Clipoff, but he's an actual old SSI guy. He oh, actually, cool. He actually joined them right after Eye of the Beholder was uh, released. And he's a friend uh, that I have over on Discord and stuff that I talk to a lot. And he's been reporting a bunch of stuff back to me because he's been playing it. That's great. I mean, it sounds like you really haven't had any uh, any uh, body like saying, well, you can't, you shouldn't be doing this or no, you know, discouraging no. any in any way. It just sounds, no. everything sounds, just sounds positive. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in fact, I talked to Beamdog about this, um, about you know, what, if there's art assets that if we're going to get into trouble by Watsi about this and they said, no, everything is covered. You're good to go, no matter what you want to do. So I was like, oh, okay, that's good. It's good to know. Yeah, that is great. Yeah. You, I know a lot of people run into the opposite. <laughs> I run into, you know, friction, I guess, for people that are like, oh, you can't use that. Yeah. We don't know where the, now there was one question I had in the video. I know some of the versions of the game have music. Yeah. Like the Sega CD versions a lot of people mentioned that I, I had to go back and listen to it it does have, you know have a pretty good soundtrack you know is there thoughts on using some of that uh music i don't know if the original game had too much but yeah in fact i was just talking to me and we were just talking about this on sunday about that and maybe trying to do voiceovers too for a lot of the characters like dran uh -huh. or kelvin but we're not sure how we can approach that because you, I mean, it's, it's hard to find people that want to donate their time and especially for free, especially mm -hmm. if you want to get somebody to create music for you too. So those are the, those are the obstacles that you run into out there with that kind of stuff. I guess some, some people want to be paid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you I, doing? I, I was, I was glad. I mean, we were lucky to find people who wanted to donate time and it's just because they were fans of the, the, the series themselves mm -hmm. and they, they wanted to donate time to the mod and do what they could, you know, like this. So I was very lucky and happy to find people like that, that were out there. You know, you see that we found some people that were in Germany, Italy, Australia, uh, Mika's in Canada and uh, some people uh, just around the U S too, that donated their time. 
This and, is um, an international global effort to bring. Yeah, it is. I mean, I'm just, I was glad to have all those people out there, you know. It, it, I bet you never thought back when you were playing the original game, you'd be doing something like this one day. I, I never did. In fact, uh, yeah, it, it just, it, this thing has evolved into a big monster, you know, it's, and it's taken up a big part of my life too, you know, my time. Have you talked to any of the other Eye of the Beholder creators? Uh, no, was I don't. With. Yeah, I don't know any of those guys or even where they're at these days. So, and none of them has really reached out to me and said anything. So, I don't know. I bet you I they just, probably heard of the, the project at this point. Yeah, I just know of um, the Beam Dog guys, and they're a bunch of the older. A lot of them are a bunch of the yeah. old uh, Bioware guys, you know, and they form Beam Dog. And um, yeah, I just can't say enough about those guys over there and their curate program, you know, what they're doing and the things that they've been doing to Neverwinter Nights Enhanced Edition. And, uh, and they're still working on it and they're gonna evolve it even more. So uh, I even asked Bernard, I said, hey, are you guys ever planning on doing a Neverwinter Nights 3? And he's like, uh, we're not sure. He says, what we're really hoping is that Neverwinter Nights will evolve to Neverwinter Nights 3. So I don't know what that exactly means, but I thought I heard that they were going to do some type of, um, what was it, a rendering, uh, a re-rendering of the engine or something like that. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but that's hmm. what I thought I heard. That sounds doable. I mean, I don't, why not? Yeah. I guess they, I wonder what kind of original assets. Yeah. Uh, like, like I said, I don't know if that's true or not. That's, that's just kind of something that I heard in the grapevine. So. I mean, it already looks pretty good for a game for this time. Yeah, I mean, you saw what they did. Have you? I don't know if you noticed what the water looked like in the original Everywhere Nights, and compared to what it's at right now. But they just redid the water effect in the in the game now, and it looks amazing. It's even shinier. <laughs> yeah. Well, it has those reflections and stuff, and then you know, the texturing of it and stuff. It just really looks great. You know, my friend, he was a. Uh... He really notices things. I, I, I just don't have an eye for it necessarily. But yeah, a lot of times he'd point out and say, look at the shadows over there. You know, this is this really looks a lot better than you know the yeah. you know, I did back on the I guess in the Pentium three days or whatever. It's it's funny you mentioned that because it's like ever since I've been working on mods and doing this kind of stuff, I'll get in a game now these days and I'll start looking around. I was like, Oh yeah, they screwed up right there. <laughs> they made something, they didn't set it right or whatever, you know. So and it's you know, it's just funny how you notice different things now because you you have an eye for it now because you when you work on stuff like this yourself. Well, do you, you know, work in this, you might want to you want to stop sharing the, the screen there for a second so we can uh, zoom in on our beautiful faces here. There we go. Yeah, so, uh, you know, spending so much time making these levels and working on the puzzles and all this stuff, I mean, do you have a, a new appreciation or understanding of, you know what what this team did back in the day the the, the achievement oh, yeah Absol absolutely i mean there's a lot of things like um i was just talking with a friend of mine and we have a, a saying about our games when we're playing a game there's like we love to play games and we want them to be fun but when a game becomes work then it becomes not fun and we don't want to play games like that because we work for a living and we already work so we don't want <laughs> games to be exactly work. so yeah so anyway Hopefully the uh, the devs for the new Dark Alliance are watching. Please, <laughs> please add key bindings for movement. How could you guys not put key bindings in for the movement keys? This is like, oh my God, really, guys? And I've, I've, I've tweeted that out and read it and stuff too. And I put it on their Discord channel and posted it to them. I was like, there's things that I can forgive in games. But when it comes to the key bindings, and if you're going to do it for a PC, please don't don't neglect the key bindings that key bindings and not having any rats in the game that's just <clears> right <throat> yeah i have to draw the line and you, you do yeah. have rats in your game so yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but no other than that though i mean i definitely have a, a better deeper appreciation for developers when they're making their games out there and because there's a lot of hard work that goes in on the back end that you just don't see and you don't realize it's going on with these guys and these guys are also pouring their hearts and souls into those games too. I mean, and it's, it, it can be really upsetting and probably frustrating for them too, whenever they release a new game. And then the community has a lot of backlash towards the game 
And that, that's just, that's probably heartbreaking for them. I know it is. Well, Rick, what's your, what's in the future for you? Are you, I know you're going to be working on these games for a while, but if you, uh, you know, further you out, know, you, uh, a lot of people ask me, are you going to do never either beholder three? Are you? And we're just like, I'm like, no, you know, that one, there was some reason why that was not feasible. Right? The, yeah. There's, there's a lot. Okay. So uh, you remember going through that one and there's a lot of parts in the game where you chop on trees and you knock them down and you find specific little hidden areas and stuff like that. That's going to be really hard to do. And then after you leave the mausoleum and then you head to the uh, myth Denor, there's the forested part. And then you're going through all these little holes. Uh, you can go right, left, forward, and it can get real confusing because they, you can end up back where you started and, or you can get lost in there really quickly. I know one time when I played it, I was stuck in there for like 15, 20 minutes trying to figure out how to get out of there. And that's just really hard to recreate uh, in, a, in an isometric top-down view game like this. You, you just can't do it. So you have to figure out another way of trying to do something to, to recreate that. And it's just really, really hard. Plus there's the underwater level. And I think it's the mage tower that you do. And then getting uh, the, the biggest challenge too, is getting somebody to make you the models that you need, like the creature models. Cause we got lucky early on that a lot of the models were already there, but the community was very thriving back in the day of Neverwinter. So they created a bunch of these creatures out there and stuff, you know, and, um, <clears throat> there's one part like I, I really love this effect too is when you're in a mage tower and, and you see the, the stone golems and they're walking around in there but they're not really walking they're moving through the floor and you see the floor cracking as they're moving and stuff like cool. that yeah and it's just like oh man how am I going to do that it was just like the same problem that we had with um the frost giant uh prison you know in uh, the beholder 2 it's like the frost giants are all standing, but originally in the game, they were down on their knees because they're stuck in this small corridor and they can't get up and move. So they're attacking you with their fist. I was like, I would love to get somebody to make a model that where they're down on their knees and they're attacking you like that. But it's just really hard to find people to do stuff like that for you. So it gets really difficult. Yeah. I don't, other than like some kind of crowdfunding solution, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. They get a couple, man, there might be somebody watching this video that would love to take a project like that on. You know? Yeah, you never know. I mean, I don't know if I could, you know, um, you know, when I started this project, I was like in my late 30s, but now I'm like 59. So it's, 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 it's just gone on a long ways. It's like 15 years ago when I first started this. Well, I was, you know, I was thinking about this, <clears throat> this morning, you know, there's so many people and I'd probably say 99% probably even higher than that, to be honest with you, people that set out to, to do something like this. Because mm -hmm. like you said, they, they start, it's fun at first. You got some energy, you got some steam, but there comes a point where you're like, oh man. <laughs> well, you, you know, this is this is going to be a lot of work. It's, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, the Beholder too, Legend of Dark Moon, yeah. it started that way. I was working with uh, Jemmy, a friend of mine, and also Mika was helping him. He actually started uh, Legend of Dark Moon first, and I created all the levels for him and a bunch of other stuff. But then he took on the project and he started it. But then it got to that point where he just stopped working on it and abandoned it. And that's probably the reason. Well, that was the reason why it didn't come out whenever I did it, because I took over the project after I found out he just didn't want to do it no more. Then I took it over and I restructured the whole thing and rebuilt it and did everything, all the scripting and stuff like that which is why it came out like, I think it was like five years later, you know, or five years ago. That's why it was so long down the road because he you just, had that determination. That's the yeah. stick to it didness, you know, the, yeah. I mean, it, um, it's I, like one of the maybe 1% of projects like this yeah. that actually gets completed. I, I get a bit. Uh, now is that some of the Marine training coming through there? Or, not? <laughs> or is that just a personality? Uh, I think it's more of my personality yeah. because I get really, when I start working on something, I get, when I get stuck in it, I just like, I just want to work on it, keep working on it until I'm done with it. Right. And, and I become a little bit of a perfectionist too, because especially when I'm placing something, I won't just plop it down. I'll look at it, make sure it's play, placed correctly. Or, or one of the things I earned, learned early on is when you're placing stuff down, say like, uh, mushrooms or something like that in a level right well you you can place them all down down but people won't won't tend to rotate them so it doesn't make it look like it's a natural look then mm. now they just look like they're all the same way and they're all facing the same way or rocks and stuff like that so you get in there you place it 
then I'll rotate it just like mugs on the table or plates on the table or stuff like that. I'll make sure I rotate it to make it look like it's a realistic thing, like that you'd actually walk up and grab it or something like that. You know, I just get, I get perfectionist like that. You know, it's those little things like that do make a yeah. big difference. Mm -hmm. it does. You know, the sad part to me is always, you know, 99% of players never, would never even notice or think about that for one second. But, you know, here you are like rotating every mushroom. Yeah. Well, <laughs> whoever watches yeah. this, people might go into the mod from this point on and start looking at things. Like, yeah, I appreciate yeah, I that. that he rotated that mushroom over there. You know? I'm going to yeah. take out a, you know, a protractor there. Just you know, appreciate yeah. thing. Uh so I guess to wrap up here, you know, I've, there's a lot of people that watch the show and they're kind of interested in making stuff themselves. You know, I mean, if, you know, if you were somebody that you never really worked with this engine before, maybe you played the games, I mean, just, just how do you kind of set yourself up for success, you uh, know, with, with a good mod? I mean, Yeah, well, first find a good uh, D&D story that, you know, people are going to want to play, you know that's that's important because what it's got to be interesting that people want and a lot of people when they play mods you like my mod there wasn't a lot of story really deep background story in ours so what we did was we wrote a bunch of uh, extra stuff and put extra things in there like when you talk to the dwarves down there and stuff like that or other characters and stuff that you'll re meet along the way or npcs or we just tried to expand the story more but finding the right story is what's really important when you're going to make a mod mm -hmm. And then after that, uh, make sure that prob I guess that you're capable of doing it because you're going to run into problems where if you need assets in the game, you can use the community assets that are out there, but you might run into something that you might specifically need for your mod that might not be there or customized scripting. That's an important thing too. You got to be able to at least hopefully you'll find somebody or you can do it yourself as write these scripts. Yeah. What is it? Uh, one of the uh, Lincoln on the name. There's a guy that teaches like C <laughs> scripting <laughs> on YouTube. That's funny because my friend Mika is like, you know, you could, should take some classes for scripting. You know, it's not that hard. I'm like, yeah, I should, but I just don't know if I have time. You know, with everything that's going on in my life right now. So, well, there you are, folks. Rick Francis. Uh, you can play his uh, his mod. Or it's a Probably the easiest way. I guess it's on GOG too, though. I think about it, right? Oh, somebody yeah. asked me that. If you get the GOG version, does it also have the curated content? It will not. Only the enhanced at Steam edition will. Okay, have so that. you need to get it from Steam to be able just to get this right. game up and run it with one. But, but you can go to one of the other. I'll have to probably should give you the links, Matt, to the Neverwinter Vault, and you can grab both modules there. I post all those links there. And so you, you, you don't you yourself. don't want any kind of payment or donations or do you have uh, anything like that for you people? Know, I, I, if somebody I, wants to support this. How do they? What do they do? Uh, I I really it's you say thanks. For me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Just if if they like the module and they played it and they they you know you you know you didn't spend money for it. You got thirty hours out of each one of the mods, which it'll take you about thirty hours to get through them. Then hey. You know, don't be one of those. It. Don't be a troll and leave nasty comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be a be a little forgiving. <laughs> so don't beat us up too bad. Yeah, I mean, it's just you know, some always it's a labor of love, right? I mean, like, right. Enjoy it. Yeah. All right. Well, it's good talking to you and meeting you, Rick. Good luck right. in the. Uh, yeah, in man. The, I just want to say again, thank you to Beam Dog and for the curated yeah. program and everything that they've done. I mean, you know, I can't thank those guys enough for everything that they're doing out there, and you know, and to the community too out there for constantly making new items and modules and uh the assets for you know for these mods for people to make you know because you, you can't give them enough uh you know you just can't thank them enough for everything that they're doing too it's it's a great thing i think that's a good note to stop on leave before you decide to turn me into a badger <laughs> You should have explored that option. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go back and explore it now. You know, I did go back and get Todd working. You know, I, I knew there must be some way to resurrect them. I figured uh, out. There is. Um, I found it. I figured there's it. rods of resurrection in the game, and there's the scrolls of, res of raised dead that you just cast it on their bones when they're on the ground. Because basically, I think a lot of people got confused about that, is what you do is you just right-click on their body, drop it on the ground of uh, the bones, uh, and then you just cast the spell on the body itself, yeah. and then it reses it. 
In fact, I don't think anybody else has ever done that the way we did it. I mean, you can find somebody that they're down in resin, but never from bones back to a full body. So yeah, that's the kind of thing as a kid. It's so thrilling, and, you know, to figure uh, something like that out. And, and we put a little secret thing on the divining pools in the very first level. When you first go down and you see it, we added a little hanging skeleton there and there's a dialogue in there. And yeah, I saw that. I didn't know what there's, to make of that. No, no, I added it since you played it. This is oh, something since, different. That oh, this Dan is something you just you like. Added. Wow. Okay. It's because brand, friend, brand new. Spanking. I, I don't. I don't know if you want me to give away the hint. Oh, or don't. Not, or if you want to try and figure out. Okay. <laughs> figure so out. basically, when you talk to the body, he's named. His name is Todd, something else. I won't give it away. But when you re person made a comment, uh, a long time ago, one of the developers out there, and it's what it's a reference to, and it's huh. it's funny. So that's what's great about this. So even if you have played the original game a hundred times, man, you still don't want to play your version because you got some of this extra stuff in there. <laughs> there, it's there unique is unique to you. I mean, uh, did you find the ancient hidden uh, secret level too? The ancient dungeon? Yes. You did? Okay. Reasonably sure I remember that. <laughs> yeah, it was after you fought the warden. Uh, there's a you find a, a hidden trap door. Will oh, yes, I definitely computer. found that. Very tough, yeah. as I recall. Yes. Yeah. Pretty tough. We did get through it. Got some pretty cool loot, too, as I recall. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things, too, I want to bring up about the loot. <clears throat> it's a very loot-intensive game, but you don't have to pick up all the loot. A lot of that loot is just more of a cosmetic thing. Like my friend Dan, he's a big stickler about, well, if he's carrying it, why isn't he dropping it? You know, if you kill him. So we kind of did took that approach a little bit, but not too hard. But some of the some of the enemies that you kill will drop items like that on the ground, you know. And you can take them and sell them. There are several merchants throughout the level that you'll find. Yeah, one's on the third those. one's on the third level, and then there's the dwarves. But don't don't piss off the dwarves. <laughs> if you if you make them mad, uh, they turn on you, and you lose that whole opportunity there. Uh, Just like the original game piss off a dwarf that just sounds like a bad idea it, it is because they have a gang, they, they're gonna gang up on you down there let me tell you so all right folks well you heard the man you know where to get the game you've seen it you've heard it what are you waiting for <laughs> go uh, check it out and send rick a nice no a nice comment <laughs> enjoy the game but thank you rick for all your work no, on thank this you, been having a lot uh, of fun yeah, thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. And I, I, I love your show. It's, I watch every episode. Oh, thank you. It's, oh, if there's anything I, else I could do to help you and your efforts, just let me know. I'll be happy to do that. Sure. Thank you. Appreciate it. And that's all for this week's episode. <laughs> Hope you guys and gals enjoyed that. I don't know. I just I had such a good time chatting with Rick. I mean, uh, a great guy, you know, and uh, he had more stuff. You know, I kept on, you know, like before the, uh, before I started recording, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff there. And then after I finished recording, we, he hung on for a while and talked some, some more. So I might have him back on because he's got a lot more great stuff to talk about. Uh, so anyway, you can touch base with him. I'll make sure to give you a link to his uh, module over at Neverwinter Nights Vault so you can check into that but probably the easiest thing is just to download the uh, module using the enhanced edition uh, okay uh oh <laughs> uh, as always i want to thank you very very much for supporting me supporting matt chat you make these episodes possible there would not be a matt chat well, i guess there would be 471 episodes but there will not be 472 episodes uh, without people like you stepping up to the plate uh, making those contributions and folks if it's a dollar a month if it's two dollars a month if it's a hundred bucks a year you know what whatever it is uh the important thing to me is that you know you're stepping up you're you're helping uh you know you're making me feel good uh, keeping these shows on the air and all that stuff uh, so i just want you to know i thank you and appreciate it so much i truly do it's uh it's a it's a great feeling and i want to say uh, a shout out here to some of the new patrons some of the new additions to the rat hack if you will <laughs> the rat slayers uh we've got godfather 101 the steam machine podcast see that's pretty clever to make your handle the name of your the thing that you're promoting you know you get a little free promotion pretty clever uh and then john and rick uh so welcome guys 
I assume these are guys. Well, welcome, y'all. <laughs> Let's do it that way. Uh, to the club. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And if for whatever reason you're like, I don't know, do I want to, you know, I watch these episodes. Uh, I haven't taken the time. I don't want to go to that guy's Patreon site. You know, uh, I don't know if I, if he really cares. You know, well, you know, whatever it is, just get over that. Because uh, you're going to like this show a lot more if you're part of it. You know, trust me on that. A buck a month. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All right, what about that news for the Matt Cave? All right, first up, a little treat. Uh, Adam, a longtime friend of the show, personal friend, uh, Adam Dayton, and his friends at his uh, podcast, Fragments of Silicon, have uh, done an interview with the great Rebecca Heinemann. This Becky Berger has come on to their show to talk about old school publishing and their Lawless Legends Apple II game. It's, it's a you know fairly in-depth uh, chat, and I think you really like it, so I'll post a link to that. Uh, you might want to skip ahead like about 10, 20 minutes or so. <laughs> you know, they're setting up a little bit at the beginning, but, you know, once it gets going, it really gets going. So uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy that. Uh, second up, uh, Amazon. Uh, apparently they are doing games now, Amazon Games. They have done a closed beta of what they're calling the New World MMO. So will this be the new WoW killer? You know, we've heard that one before. It says, explore a thrilling open world MMO filled with danger and opportunity, where you'll be, well, where you will forge a new destiny for yourself as an adventurer shipwrecked on the supernatural island of Eternum. So, fight, forage, uh, forge. So apparently a lot of crafting in this game. Supernatural forces, deadly weapons, and a classless, that's kind of interesting. So this one's classless, uh, real-time combat system. You can fight alone with a small team or massive PV, PvP battles. So I guess they're not, you know, going for, uh, you know, this should be pretty different than WoW, I, I suppose, is the result of that and the way that it's set up. Uh, anyway, it looked kind of interesting to me. Uh, you know, I might wait and see what people think before I uh, pre-order it. Or, you know, let me know what you think about it. Uh, there are some reports out there about um, GPUs. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I haven't really looked into how legitimate this is, but there's a couple of different sites saying that they can da that this game somehow damages your, uh, your GPU card. Uh, so, so again, I don't know if there's any truth to that or not. Might, I'm just saying you might want to look into that uh, before you go installing this thing and you know potentially wrecking your card. Uh, who knows though? Uh, you know, again, let me let me know what you think. I haven't really explored too much of this, uh, so I'd like to hear from you guys about it. Uh, and then finally, thanks to Michael. Uh, over on Discord, posted this article by Chris Avalon. And uh, now this is a not safe for work article, or uh, it's basically got some uh, salty language in it. Uh, some <laughs> very salty language, even in the title. I can't even tell you what the article is called. Uh, I'll have to censor this. What the bleep happened to Bloodlines 2? Uh, so, I know a lot of people love that Bloodlines uh, game. You're like, what did happen? Well, you can read this article and find out. Now, he doesn't go on a lot of uh, answers so much as just, <laughs> you know, just telling you how frustrating it was for him, I guess, and the other people that worked on Just exasperating. It's kind of like this. Uh, the way he describes it, just kind of this big epic disaster, uh, epic fail. So uh, anyway, you could definitely go check that out. I think you'll find that entertaining. Uh, do note, however, the salty language before you go clicking on the link. All right, well, uh, what about that Belgian ale? All right, so I'm here in the uh, rat skeller, if you will. Uh, look at this Belgian triple. I just thought I would give you a little bit of a, an overview of what's in this thing. It's got a Belgian Cara 8 specialty grain, half pound of that. Uh, gold malt syrup, clear Belgian candy sugar, and gold malt syrup. And then it's got, uh, I guess, about 9.15 pounds of that gold malt syrup in there. German pearl hops, an ounce of that, and then an ounce of SAAZ. So I don't know if that's SAZ or SAZ. Uh, so it wasn't too hard to make. It's just the, it takes a long time. So it was, uh, I guess, about three months total. I'm wanting to say, I feel like it's a little bit longer than that. But, you know, you could probably go three or four months on this. Uh, 
you know, you're not going to get it any, any sooner, I think, than uh, three months anyway, uh, which is about where this one is. And, and of course, uh, you don't want to just have a huge glass of this, <laughs> especially, you know, especially like uh, one o'clock in the afternoon when I'm recording this. So I'm just going to maybe do a half a glass uh, just to get a, a sense of this uh, ale. Let's go ahead and pour it in the glass. And of course, this is kegged. And so that ought to be a good amount. And these typically are quite strong. Uh, so you don't want to go crazy with these, obviously. If you order a, a Belgian triple or a quad or something like that in a, in a, in a bar or restaurant, you know, typically they will give you a small glass uh, for obvious reasons. But you can see the... You know, I'll go in the other room to uh, sample it. But man, just the, the head on that. Nice bubbles. Ah. <sighs> Man, this smells amazing. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, if I didn't know better, I would think that you'd just gone into like a, you know, specialty uh, liquor store and pulled off like a high quality Belgian ale. You know, the Trappist uh, type stuff and just, just poured it right in this glass. Man, if it tastes as good as it smells, I think we're in for a real treat. <laughs> it might even have been worth waiting all those months. <laughs> but anyway, let me uh, get set up in the other room. We'll, we'll sample this. All right, so I've been letting this breathe a while. <sighs> Still smells really good. No alcohol fumes on this. No uh, sort of funny odors or anything. Just smells like a good Belgian ale should smell, which to me is kind of a citrusy uh, aroma. Not too pronounced. It's kind of a... You know, to me, it's kind of like if you had a, you know, big bowl of raisins, maybe, and you were kind of smelling that with a little bit of orange on top. <laughs> yeah, kind of hard to describe, but it's a good, it's a good aroma. But anyway, let's give this thing a taste, man. It's like it's been so, it takes so long to make this. <laughs> you just can't help but be a little bit nervous about it. You know, it's a lot of effort if this thing uh, sucks. But, but anyway, here we go. Oh. Uh. Now that is that is potent <laughs> strong flavor very uh, thick almost creamy like in its uh, consistency uh you get a sort of a God, how to describe that taste uh, i want to say like a dark sweet is uh <laughs> i guess somebody's excited as i am about this um kind of this dark sweet sort of roasted uh taste to it let me try it again here Yeah, it's definitely, uh, what I taste more than anything, I guess, is a little bit of the sweetness, a little bit of bitterness on the back end there uh, going down. It's actually <laughs> quite smooth. Um, you, know, you can definitely tell the uh, a difference, I think, the fact that it's conditioned for so long. You know, again, like three months uh, sitting in there, <laughs> sitting in the keg. So it tastes quite a bit different than the other uh, beers I brewed, probably just because of that. Uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily good or bad, uh, taste just a different try it one more time here so yeah that is quite tasty and i'm not, not going to claim it's the best belgian ale <laughs> you know certainly not i mean but that's setting a very high bar i mean those are uh, one of the connoisseurs considered the uh, well, at least some of the connoisseurs considered those some of the finest ales period in the whole world uh, so just the fact if you can even get like an approximation of that <laughs> <laughs> You're doing pretty well. Uh, now, I bet you I could probably pour this into a glass, and you might think it's just a Belgian ale off the shelf. Uh, most people probably think that. Uh, so I'm going to give it high marks for that. But, you know, you know, if I was, <laughs> would I choose this? <laughs> oh, I don't know, over a, God, what's that company that makes all those fabulous uh, Trappist ales? You know, the ones that have the little picture of the, the monk on them? Uh, those are just, to me, impossible to beat. You know, there's a couple of them like that. There's some uh, brewed, out of, uh, brewed up in Canada, actually, that are quite good out of the... Uh, oh, I have to see if I can get the name of that. Unibrow, Unibro, Unibrew, kind of a... I don't know how to pronounce their name, but they make some pretty good uh, versions of these as well. Uh, but anyway, I'm not going to rate my own beer. Uh, if I just wanted to rate the recipe, I'll say, yeah, that was a lot of fun making that. Uh, not too hard, just, you know, take some time. Uh, but if you want to brew some ale and you, uh, you like these uh, trip, uh, triples... You know, you might be able to tweak this a little bit and get even closer to that flavor. 
Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not bad. It's a, <laughs> it's definitely not one you would chug. Uh, definitely not. But, you know, if you have a small glass of this, you know, that, that could work out quite well. Almost like a drinking a scotch or a bourbon, maybe. Uh, I have no idea what the alcohol content is in that. <laughs> so just, just say, uh, you know, take it slow uh, and leave it at that. Uh, but anyway, that there you go. The uh, That's from uh, Northern Brew uh, Recipe. I'll give you a link to that, too, if you want to make it yourself. All right, but let's uh, wrap it up with a quotation. And since uh, Rick is a was a Marine for so many years, I was looking for quotes by famous Marines, and there's actually quite a few good ones. <laughs> I've had many to choose from, but this one is from a Lieutenant General Victor A. Victor H. Krulak uh, of the USMC, April 1965. And I thought it was a really good quote. It goes something like this. Being ready is not what matters. What matters is winning after you get there. So ponder on that, and see you guys next time. You cannot do one single pull-up?